Thanks for coming and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really happy that this talk happens in the morning because I'm fresh. Uh, I will be do, doing live coding, so this is going to be difficult both for me and for us. Uh, I will make it. Uh, I will try to make it as easy to follow as possible. But please pay attention. And um, if anyone has problems seeing the letters, please let me know. Uh, this is the terminal. Is the font big enough? All right. All right, so let's dive in. Uh, my name is Michael. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm going to be talking about caching in microservices. And uh, first of all, a quick uh, intro into what we will try to do today. Uh, this is the setup I prepared. It's a fairly standard setup with a microservice and an API gateway at the front. So uh, the browser will send a HTTP request to the API service. This is the API gateway that is exposed to the outside world. And then uh, internally, this, this service has a client, uh, HTTP client, that passes the request uh, to the underlying service. And this service has a database in it. Uh, it's Postgres uh, running on top of SQL Alchemy. And then this, the, to the service will uh, return the response and the API service will pass that response back to the browser. And the thing we are trying to do uh, is to implement caching in such a way that the browser doesn't need to know about that. So uh, assuming that queries to the database are expensive, uh, we would like to avoid them as much as possible uh, without requiring anything uh, to be implemented on the browser side. And the way we're going to do that is using uh, the ETAG mechanism. Oh, sorry about the colors. Don't know what happened here. So uh, typically, what happens? Uh, what I just described: the browser sends a request uh, for a to-do list with a, some kind of ID uh, to the API gateway. Then this is passed. Well, first of all, uh, API Gateway needs to check if you have access to that list. Uh, uh, so if you are a collaborator, because people might use uh, the same list uh, like in a group. And this requires querying the database. And then uh, API service will ask uh, to the service about the list itself. And this also requires the, uh, querying the database for the list itself, for the, all the entries, and so on. So uh, the way ETAG caching works is that during the first call, uh, when API service uh, issues the GET request to to-do service, uh, on the to-do service side, we are supposed to compute the hash of the response after producing it and send it back to the API service. Uh, this is done via HTTP header called ETAG, and it, it's a basically just a string, uh, but it should uniquely match the, the response. And API service is going to store that and then pass the body back to the browser. But the second time, the browser asks for the same thing. The browser behaves exactly in the same way. And the API service will f first check if it has any hash stored already. And if it does, it's going to send a GET request to, to the service. But this time, it's going to include an if not match header with the string. This allows API service to verify that the cache is fresh and the underlying document did not change in the meantime. And to the service is supposed to verify that. And if uh, the cache is OK and fine, uh, like the document wasn't modified in the meantime, then to the service is going to reply with uh, 304 not modified status and not include the body. Uh, and then API service will fetch the body from its own uh, cache uh, and then return it back to the browser. So that's the overall view. And we're going to try to implement that live. So let's get to work. Uh, what I have here is uh, this is the, the to-do service. So we're going to start with that. This is the backend service that has the database. Uh, it's done in a fast API. This is the service. And here, somewhere here, is a request. Uh, like the view that uh, returns uh, our to-do lists. And I figured the nice way to capture the response and comp compute an ETAC for that is to implement a middleware. 
uh, but in order, there's one, one important thing, in order to, for it to capture the whole response, uh, we need to make it a pure ASGI middleware, not a fast happy one, because the response might be streamed. Uh, so when your service starts sending back uh, the body, it might do it in chunks. And we need to retrieve all the chunks before computing the whole hash for the whole body. So in ASGI parlance, uh, a middleware is just a synchronous function, uh, but this function needs a state, so I'm gonna wrap it in a class. And because I'm lazy, I'm gonna use our data classes every, everywhere where I can. So we need two things. We need to uh, know the application and we need to know the, uh, the cache storage itself. And the cache storage itself is also going to be a data class. For now, it's gonna be empty uh, for simplicity. So now, when, when you have those, you can install the cache uh, in the, in the backend service. So let's do this. I think I have a, oh, it should work. Okay, uh, memory cache and cache middleware. And now here we're gonna instantiate the cache. Just like that, and then install it. Add middleware, this is gonna be cache middleware, and we're gonna pass our cache as the argument. And then whenever a request comes, uh, it will go through that middleware and the way it happens is that uh, ASGI server will call uh, will call this middleware basically. So we're going to implement under call for that. And the arguments here are going to be uh, scope, whatever that is, and two callables: one for receiving data and one for sending data back to the client. Uh, we don't really need to know the details about, about uh, what the scope exactly is, but we, we know one thing. The scope uh, contains type, because in ASGI between the your application and the server, there are a couple of things happening. Uh, and we are interested only in HTTP traffic, so we're going to check for that first. So if type is not HTTP, uh, sorry. We're gonna just call the application, passing the arguments, and return. Now, if, if the scope is of HTTP type, then we know that we can create a request out of it, request object uh, from the scope. And then, having that, uh, we're gonna pass uh, everything as is to the application, but this time we're gonna override the send method so that every chunk of the body goes through our function. And for that we're gonna create another function called cache send. And for that we need uh, access to the cache, we need access to the request itself and the original send. And this is gonna look like that. Uh, first, it needs the cache. It needs the request itself. And it needs the send function. And then the callable is also asynchronous. And it gets uh, something called the message. That is, it, this is, message is a, like a part of the body or part of the response that it that it's supposed to go to the browser or to the client, to the HTTP client. And now those messages, uh, we are in HTTP scope uh, because of the type we checked uh, earlier. So we uh, here we're gonna receive two types of messages. It's either be a response start or response body. 
So first of all, uh, uh, there is a state machine internally, so we are supposed to get the response start first and then body a couple of times uh, if the response is chunked. So if the message uh, type is HTTP response start, then we're gonna just store it. And obviously we need a, a field for that. And it's gonna be a message or none, starting with empty. And, uh, and that's it. So we are going to accumulate that, but not send it to the client yet. And th then if it's not HTTP response start, then we know it's an HTTP response body. Uh, so we can start accumulating the chunks. Body append message. And obviously we need uh, something for that as well. And this time it's gonna be a list of messages. And it's gonna be empty at the beginning. And after all, all of that, uh, right, and the, the last chunk contains a field called more body set to false. So we're gonna check for that. So if message uh, says that there is more body coming, uh, then we're gonna just return and we're gonna keep accumulating. Uh, so eventually the, the application will send us a chunk that has, uh, uh, sorry, if more body is true. Eventually uh, the application will send us the last chunk that has more body set to false. Uh, and at this point we know that we have the whole response uh, stored in memory. So if, since we do that, we can, well, now we can produce it to the client uh, and before uh, sending it back to the client, we can modify it a bit, for example, to include this ETAC header. But first of all, let's send it back to the client so it's, it's transparent. So when we did that, everything should be transparent. Uh, the middleware, I think, is, is, is already installed here. So we're gonna try it. And it doesn't work. <laughs> of course. And let's see what we did wrong. and body, yes, thank you, live coding. Thank you, audience. <laughs> yes, and this is the response, everything is transparent, nothing happens. But we, what, what we can do now is we can compute the, uh, well, first of all, reassemble the whole response from the chunks. Uh, so this is gonna be that. And then compute an intake for that. And we're gonna base 64 encode it immediately. From the body, this is the digest. Uh, so this is our ETAC. And we can now uh, say that our response start headers, we're gonna add that header, uh, the ETAC header, the one we need, uh, to the response. And also, we're gonna store whatever we have just produced in our cache. And we're gonna store, uh, what do we need uh, for that? We need, uh, we need the request. We need uh, headers of the response. We don't need the body here. So let's, let's, uh, let's imagine we have this and we're gonna do that in, in, in the meantime, uh, later on and an ETAC. So the, the, the property for the response headers is gonna be trivial. Because we have the response start, response start contains all the headers we need, so we're gonna just, 
wrap it in a, in a nicer uh, way. To convert that from raw ASGI data structures into something that we can use later on. And we're going to store it. We don't have the store method yet, so let's implement that. So this is the store. Store takes self, takes the request, takes response headers, and takes an e tag. And first of all, we need the cache key. So let's create that from the request. Request, and then store that in our cache uh, as an entry. And the entry is going to contain e tag and response headers. So we don't have the key method yet. So the cache key uh, is going to be the method, like a tuple containing a method and the URL. For now. Uh, this is not going to be sufficient, and you will see that later on. But uh, let's start with this and see what happens. And the entry is an e tag. That's the string. String and uh, response headers. That is headers. Now we need the attack, silence, whatever happens here. We store, stop complaining, please. And we set the header. So everything should work. Let's see if it does. It doesn't. Self response uh, headers, not row headers. Memory cache has no attribute cache, uh, obviously, because I forgot to add it. Uh, this is going to be just a dictionary of tuple to cache entry. And it's going to start empty by default. And now we have something. Now, supposedly, our backend service now computes the e tags and returns them back to the client. Now, uh, we don't see those because we don't log anything. Uh, so let's move to the client and see if the client really sees that. Uh, this is the client, an HTTP client that is already prepared uh, for, for some work. Uh, we have a, a, a session, uh, like an HTTP client session that is overridden. And it customizes the cache response uh, and cache request. So we'll, we're going to try adding our code here to see if the e-tag is there. Now we're going to start with uh, just calling the parent uh, start. And now when the response is initialized and IO HTTP does everything it needs, uh, we, should have have, we should have access to all the headers that have been passed uh, by, the, by the service to us. So let, let's see if the e-tag is there. And if it's there, we're going to just log it. And see, let's see if that helps. It is there. Yay. Right, so we are the client. We have just received an e-tag. So we need now our own cache storage uh, in order to store the response, including the body this time. So because we are lazy, we're going to copy everything. The, the cache is going to behave uh, pretty much the same way uh, with a couple of differences. First of all, the response is going to be the whole response, not just the headers. Uh, now. Here we need to change the class because in IRHTTP it's called request info. It does the same thing. Response. Uh, now we need a response. And key is going to be uh, c constructed in the same way. This is important. Like the, the client and the service need to ha have the logic that computes the key in the same way. Uh, so, so let's keep that. 
And now we need uh, some bookkeeping in order to uh, add everything, like, like have this cache accessible. Uh, so let's do that. We're gonna do the same for the request uh, to make our lives easier later. Uh, session needs the same thing. And uh, we're gonna do partial applications. So that all uh, response and request objects created for the session point to the same cache. And uh, and the way this, this session is implemented in, on the client side is that it, it creates a new uh, client session for every request that comes in from the, from the browser. And it's also a middleware. Uh, so we're gonna add the, the cache to that in, a, in the same way that we, as we did before. And here, pass the cache. Right, so... Uh, uh, whenever we install the session middleware, we need to pass the uh, memory cache to that, and it's going to be propagated down to every response and request object. Um, and in order for that to happen, we need also to instantiate the cache uh, on the client side this time. And this is the session middleware that we need to augment with the caching. Right, so back to the client. Uh, we know that the e tag is there, so since we know that, we can now access the cache and store the thing we need. And the thing we need uh, to pass here is request info. Fortunately, we have that because uh, in IO HTTP, all response objects contain also a pointer to the request that calls the response. Uh, we're going to store self and the e tag itself. So let's try it. Yeah, nothing broke. So this is supposedly happening. So now we have stored the the cache on. Uh, we st have stored the e tag we received from the server on the client side. And now, in order to do the second call, uh, whenever we issue a request, we need to check if there is something in the cache. And instead of adding this e tag header, this time we need to add if not much, on the client side. So let's do that. If there is an entry. Now we need a get method, so we're gonna implement that in a second. Then we're gonna update the headers. And we're gonna uh, send the e tag we have in our cache in order for the server to verify that. And the get method is going to be trivial. Uh, request info and it returns either a cache entry or none. And uh, we need the key constructed in the same manner and self cache get key, and we're gonna just return that. Nothing really interesting. So now, whenever we issue a request, everything should work. But this time, on the server side, we should be receiving if not match header. So let's check if this happens. We're gonna check that in the middleware as well right here, because right here we have created the request and supposedly this request contains if non match header. So let's see if it's there. And if it's there, we're gonna just log it for now to see if, it, if, it, uh, if it's really there.
So the first time around, it was not there uh, because it, this was the first call, but the second call indeed contains that and in, it contains the same e tag that we have just generated in the first call. So this is good. And we're gonna check that information now. So the, the client says that I have a resource and the hash of that resource is this and that. So please check it if it's the same and or the, the resource changed in, in the meantime. So we're gonna check it. Uh, so if the client says uh, that it has some, some uh, hash, we're gonna see if there is a matching entry in our cache. And uh, that whatever the client sent is the same as what we have on the server side. Uh, for that, we need the get method, so we're gonna just copy that. Because lazy is good. Uh, it needs a request, and it works the same way. <laughs> and now, we know that whatever we have is the same as what the client has. So we're gonna simulate, uh, or, well, we're gonna just respond with 300 for not, mod not modified. And we're gonna do that directly by just sending the messages in ASGI. So the first message, as we know, is HTTP response start. It needs to contain the status. That's gonna be 304. And it needs headers. And headers, we're gonna take from the entry. Uh, but we're gonna need to encode them in ASGI as row headers. And then we're gonna send uh, another message that this time is HTTP response body. And we know that there is no more, no more body. And we're gonna return. So this means that the second call should now return a 304 with empty body. Oh, but only if, if not match, matches uh, whatever we have in the cache already. So let's see if it's true. This is the first call, and this is the second call. And uh, nothing happened, I uh, don't, don't know why, because it should. So let's log it first. Uh, Soft cache get request, if not match, it's entry attack. Let's see. Let's restore the, the log. Should be working. Hmm. So the if is not there. It doesn't work. This part worked, as I remember. It does. So for some reason, entry is not there. Entry is there. All right, uh, I, I messed up encoding. Uh, e tag in cache entry should be a string, and it's uh, it's uh, bytes. Uh, this is because I forgot to decode it here. And now it should it should work. So we're gonna restore everything here, and now try the first call and the second call. Now, this happens. Uh, ETAG is correct and everything is all right, but the client now says that the response is invalid. Why? Because the response now contains no body and the client expects that to be some kind of JSON because the client uh, doesn't retrieve the body from the cache yet. So we need to do that. So this is the response and now we, ne we need to check that if uh, self status is 304 and we have an entry uh, this means that we now need to 
pretend that we received the same body that we have stored in the cache previously. So let's let's do this uh, ju just by cheating. Entry response status. We need to do the same thing for the reason. Uh, this is the string describing the status. And now the body. And otherwise, uh, we need to check the attack. Oh, there's one thing that we also need to check here. I forgot about that. We need to check uh, that we cache only 200s because uh, otherwise everything is going to break when we try to send posts or patch requests. And we probably also need to check that the method uh, was the get and self so status is 200. So now, now let's try again. This is the first call. This is the second call. And now if you look closely, you can see that during the first request, we did query the database. And the, in the second call, we did not. This is exactly what we wanted. And supposedly our work is done here. Well, no. Why? Why? Because uh, uh, right here, when, whenever we issue a request, we identify ourselves th with this header. So we are asking for lists uh, owned or uh, accessed by this particular user. So if we say that we are a different user, our cache is going to work badly. It's going to leak data, and it's going to return the list uh, that is the same, because we cache by URL and method. We don't cache by adding any additional headers. This is wrong. So. Let's fix that. We have nine minutes, so we can fix that. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, it works, uh, or it may work in HTTP by abusing or using a header called vary. There is a header in HTTP that says that uh, the content of the response, the body or the format, uh, depends on some headers sent by the client. And this is exactly what happens here. Uh, the response depends on the uh, header, X user header, sent by the client. And this is even uh, visible uh, right here because we query the database uh, not only based on URL, but on the value of one of the headers. So let's do this. Let's set this header to X user. But this is not enough. We need to now include that information in the cache key uh, that we use. So let's go back to the cache and see what happens. Uh, the cache middleware and everything here uh, stays the same uh, because we, uh, do, to the cache itself and the, the mechanism, we send the whole request. So we have access to both request headers and uh, response headers. So what we know that this should include uh, the headers here, and we're going to add them to the key. We're going to add them as a, a series of tuples. Uh, the first part of the tuple is going to be name of the header, and the, sec the uh, second part, uh, the second item, is going to be the value of that header in the request. This is a tuple. And now we need to uh, include that everywhere whenever we access the key. This is going to be a bit of a problem, uh, but we're going to solve the problem as well. Now, uh, whenever we store something, uh, we know that the vary, vary headers comes from response. And this is going to be, uh, this might be empty. And we're going to split that by the semicolon uh, because we, we might have multiple. And we're going to filter out empty, uh, empty headers, just in case. Now, this is the store method. That was easy. 
Now the get method is more complicated because now we don't have access to the response. So uh, we need to get these very headers from somewhere. Fortunately, we can just memorize them. This is a dictionary. And we're going to memorize them by URL, assuming that the API is sane uh, and uh, the same endpoint returns the, the same vary all the time. Uh, this is a big assumption, but uh, we control both sides, both the API client, uh, the API gateway, and the underlying service, so we know that we can be sane. And here, we're going to just retrieve it. Request URL. Oh, it, it might not exist. That's going to be an empty list by default. Right. So now we incorporated the vary header into whatever cache uh, we do. And now it is supposed to work. So whenever we get the list for user foo once and twice, this is cached and there is no query to the database. But we do that for the other user, it's gonna return an empty list and we're gonna ask again uh, for, the, for the another user, it's not gonna ask the database. This is good. Let's see what happens here. Oh, so we, when we ask for one user and then for the second user, uh, like switching between them, it always hits the database. Why? Uh, well, this is because we only implemented these very headers on the server side. And I said before that our client needs to construct the key in the same way. If it doesn't, uh, it's not gonna work as well. So the only thing that is left is adding the, the same mechanism uh, to, on the client side. So let's do that and hopefully we'll be done. <laughs> And this is going to be really, really easy. Because we just need to copy the code. Headers, list of strings. Uh, the same thing needs to happen with the default dict. Sorry. Right here. Now the store needs to be modified in the same way. But this time we get headers from the response object. That's the only difference. And then in get, we do the same thing. Uh, Very headers, and we need to pass that to our key function. Right, and now it's, let's see what happens now. We ask for the list of foo, it is cached, very good. We ask for the list of bar. It is cached, very good. And now we ask for foo, and it is cached. So everything works. Uh, everything works until we change the, uh, the object itself. And this thing I will post on Discord uh, for, for this talk, because I'm running out of time. Uh, cache invalidation uh, is going to be not so complicated as you think. Uh, and I, I'm going to send the link to the repo when this is implemented. Uh, but for now, let's let's stop here, because uh, I imagine this was enough for everyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> certainly for me. <laughs> right. So uh, unfortunately, I will not be doing a Q&A here. But I will do a QA and a in the hallway, because I really need coffee now. Uh, <laughs> so feel free to grab me immediately after the talk, if you want, um, or on Discord, or whenever during the conference. Thank you. Thank you.